Hello. It's always a bit weird when you say hello and nobody actually says it back to you. So, uh, but we'll go, we'll roll with it. So um, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. It is actually fun enough if you never been to the united kingdom actually it's a beautiful sunny day i've had to block it out otherwise you won't be able to see me um now i'll give you a brief introduction into who i am if you haven't met me before or you were not on the course when i came uh, my name is jimmy michael i'm one half of omt training um now my background is from sports and exercise science uh into sports and remedial massage therapy then into osteopathy, which in the United Kingdom, the UK, is a five, uh, four or five year degree. Um, now, what we're planning to do um, today is discuss um, certain aspects of manipulation into why we do it, what's the point, um, how we use it, what setting, and you guys will be able to, at some point, um ask me directly some questions and uh hopefully um we can get those answered for you uh now also on top of uh sort of background of education uh i've co-authored um three or four books now uh one you can see behind me which is in osteopathic uh mobilizations what we call articulation and if you're looking at it, if you look carefully you'll see that it's been translated into korean awesome um but what we're discussing actually is what i've got just here bear with me is spinal manipulation and you can see it's got osteopathic and chiropractic techniques on there and what's just been released so this was volume one and what's just been released is this uh volume two now the difference between the two um well volume one volume two um basically the difference between this and this is this one uh just adds more techniques um so should you really get both of them together well yes you should because actually you'll be covering everything um and if you stay on long enough uh the doctor will kindly talk you through something uh regarding the books but everything we do is based upon these so everything that we discuss is within them at much greater depth um when you come on the course uh the pictures that we give you in the course handbook that is um that is all based on the book and we use the pictures from within the book so we don't give you a um a cheaper picture as such um we give you the pictures that we use uh, in the book directly in the training manuals and that's all um available when you come uh, onto uh an omt training uh, seminar uh, in Dubai through Learnovate. So absolutely uh, would love to have you and take you through it. Now, uh, I can see uh, somebody's not getting some audio. So hopefully that can be sorted. Uh, obviously check your uh, microphones and make sure that you are using your speakers and et cetera, et cetera. Hey, look, I'm not an IT guy. Um, now, let's kind of go through some of the main questions that people ask um, and then well, I'll throw it out to you to see what questions you think I've missed. So the kind of question one, what is spinal manipulation or just manipulation in general? Um, well, do you know what? It's a very good question because essentially your patients will ask you um, what it is um, in the sense of you can't just walk up to a patient and say, can I crack your neck? Can I crack your back? um and things like this so manipulation for me is using um a technique where we engage the barrier so we engage the dysfunction uh, the dysfunctional range of motion and we use a short sharp movement and we apply an impulse to that area which may may or may not result in a click now we'll come back later uh, and discuss whether you need the click or you or you don't need the click uh, we'll come back to that. Now, the the essence of understanding what it is you're doing is when a patient says to you, oh, uh, yeah, my problem is X, Y or Z. And you say, can I crack your back? And they ask you why. And you go, well, I haven't really got a good enough answer. But hey, look, it sounds cool. Um, and I think it might get you better. That is not enough. But you need to keep it 
fairly simple and the most simple way of them, this is after testing and we'll come back to this also but after testing this is what i found your problem is and i would like to use manipulation as a method to increase your quality and quantity of movement that is essential um, quality and quantity of movement is what you're aiming to do now fundamentally is that different to any other technique that you use what do you think what's the aim of all your other techniques can anyone type fast enough what is the aim of of all your manual therapy techniques come on somebody type nice and quick no well it's to improve quality and quantity of movement guys um that's essentially what it's for so is manipulation the only technique you can use no is it the best one no you need to understand that you can use any technique at any point in time that you think is best for the patient not what you think is easiest for you um, it's more what you think will get them best, better, the fastest. Now, what do we mean by better? What do we mean by better? We mean improving quality and quantity of movement. I know I can see some of you have put pain relief, relief pain. Yes, look, that's essential, but that comes under uh, quality. Improve movement, that comes under quantity. But what happens if you're saying these to the patients and you don't achieve these? through your technique what happens this is why when patients ask me what i'm going to do in the treatment my answer to everything is improving quality and quantity of movement and i also reiterate to them that you may not get uh quality and quantity together so sometimes pain does go down but they still move uh with an antalgic gait uh, sometimes they move perfectly but they're still in pain can you see why we say quality and quantity of movement? OK. Um, all right. Now, another question I get asked is where, as you can see on the book, on both books, it says osteopathic and chiropractic techniques. Uh, so fundamentally, and you'll ask this by patients as well. It's not just fellow professionals. Patients will ask you as well. What is the difference between osteopath chiropractor or osteopathic or chiropractic um, actually i turn this around and i would say uh, there are more similarities than there are differences um, and i would say that is now applicable to all manual therapies uh, so you can call yourself a physiotherapist an osteopath uh, spine whisperer osteomyologist you can call yourself whatever it is you think you want to call yourself fundamentally we are all there for the benefit of the patient. We are all there to improve quality and quantity of movement. OK. So in terms of overall differences, there's more similarities than there are differences. Fundamentally, there is a teaching difference between osteopaths, chiropractors and physios as kind of the more mainstream. But actually, we all use almost identical techniques. Um, we may just explain them slightly differently so you can make your own mind up but that's the explanation that i give my patients that there are more similarities than there are differences that's it okay so we can move on to what we uh think that the effects of spinal manipulation so what does it do can anyone type fast enough what do you think it does what do you think it does anyone type fast enough See, this is when we got the touch typers going like this, like crazy. So you, I'll give you a couple of seconds just to join in with me and you tell me what you think um, spinal manipulation does. Anyone? OK, so the classic, the classic form over the over the years uh guy you're you're talking about i'm more talking about uh some of you are putting uh movements improved range of motion that's the effects i'm talking uh what's actually going on within the body so the most classic 
aspect of what people said uh, was going on with the manipulations is that they were changing the position of joints and that way um, they were eliciting the manipulation. Look, we've moved away from a biomechanical model. You know, in terms of we like to be evidence based practitioners. Um, and from the evidence, the evidence is showing us. Uh, see, look, someone's just put improved spinal alignment. The answer is no. The biomechanical theory of manipulation is at this point in time. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying at this point in time, based on the research, it's fairly implausible in terms of actually having two joints that are misaligned and then you are aligning. OK, that doesn't really uh, that is not really supported in the in the, the research. Uh, I can see someone's put a uh, corrective of deformity. No, you're improving quality and quantity of movement. You are not changing the structural anatomical position of these joints okay full stop based on the current research further from the research the changes from manipulation are neurophysiological in nature and this actually stands for all your manual therapy techniques so whether you use myofascial release massage therapy uh, even if you use the, the the guns you know that people are using uh, chiropractors use activators Anything that you are doing has a neuro neurophysiological effect and the biomechanical corrective aspect currently is not supported. But remember, I said earlier, I'm not saying it's impossible. And through th further research, they may change that process. But at the moment, we have moved to neurophysiological where you are affecting the ascending and descending inhibitory pathways. You are affecting the body uh, through the periaqueductal gray matter uh, within the spinal cord through the ascending pathways and then into the hypothalamus relieve, uh, releasing pardon me releasing uh, your natural uh, opioids so your pain relieving chemicals within your body that happens with manipulation and that is fairly supported in the research so we need you guys and this is how we teach we we don't tell you you are correcting alignment because you are not if you are correcting alignment you would see people coming in and I can't really do this um, on a on a on a webinar, but they come in like this and you click them and then they suddenly do this. Uh, I've seen in spinal multi visit leg leg discrepancy uh, that is uh, unsupported. Uh, the changes in leg length discrepancy that is changed. Uh, that is not uh, supported rather. Sorry, pardon. Uh, that is not supported in the research. What, this is being and this is stuff that has been spoken about for years and years and it was stuff that was taught to me when i was a student and it still didn't seem that plausible um now if you are discussing this with uh podiatrists for example uh or it depends where you are chiropodists podiatrists very similar professions um they they would not even begin to try and make changes with anything are uh, less than a three centimeter uh, difference of leg length. So we're coming along as manual therapists, as I said, manual therapists can mean anything, um, and saying, oh, you know, you have a couple of degrees of uh, change here and your leg length is half a centimeter out there. Well, actually, it's not, it's not well supported. You know, you have one foot that may be a half size bigger or smaller than the other one but we don't suddenly see people stretching each other's feet to try and make them aligned um so we've got to be sensible and again we want to be evidence-based and evidence-based practitioners and and currently it doesn't support it we are dealing with neurophysiological effects okay and we go into much more depth in that scenario of what is happening through the afferent and efferent pathways all in within these two books so i suggest you get them uh okay so uh we kind of covered why you use it and you'll hear me saying over and over again you're improving quality and quantity of movement and you are not not and i stress you are not uh, correcting deformities okay now when it comes to um uh, correcting function 
guys, you're the physios. What's the magic word within physiotherapy? What do you guys do more than any other profession? What do you give to your patients? Uh, the pelvic tilt is evident in scans. Uh, you you may need to elaborate on what you mean by proper manipulation. So we'll come back to that. Emray, my man, well done. Well typed first. Exercise. Fundamentally. Full stop. Exercise. Movement is medicine. OK, now when it comes to these misalignments and structural misalignments, OK, uh, can you tell me the name of the book? Osteopathic and chiropractic techniques for manual therapists. OK. When it comes to correcting things. It is exercise. Uh, Jose. Yes, my man. I'm saying my man. I'm just assuming uh, manual techniques followed by exercises. Yes, we we have this saying in, in our clinics and in our teaching. 75% of your therapy should be done off the table, not on it. Does that sound, if I just said something that's um, profound, um, because it's not, it's not profound. Exercise is a fundamental key to function. And as, as we, as osteopaths would say, structure governs function. If the structure is not, does not have a good quality and quantity of movement, then the function will be decreased. Simple. OK, that's why when my patients come in, I'm fully turning. I, I'm actually discussing with them and qualifying them to tell them that they have to have an active participation within their therapy. So what I'm not going to do is basically kind of just go like this and give them a sheet of exercise. They will get a lot of hands on manual therapy, but they will also get a lot of exercises that are relevant to improving the quality and quantity of movement and also their structure to improve their function. OK, that is what is absolutely fundamentally key. And that's what I want you guys to be doing. You're doing it already. You know the exercise stuff. You just need to make sure that you are giving them the manual therapy um, intervention as and when it's needed. Does that but flip that round? Am I saying you have to rub and crack everything before you give exercises? No, that's not what I'm saying. If manual therapy is not warranted at a particular patient. So, for example, you've decided that patient has come in with a um a shoulder pathology and you don't think manual therapy is the, the appropriate intervention they go, go straight to the exercise but i don't see i don't see what i've just said as profound i think that's common sense i think what's what's being lost is the what's being lost is the ability to mold the two together what i hear a lot of is therapists saying um, I do my exercise therapy and my manual therapy. Why have they been separated? That's my question. That's my question. And within our teaching, we are constantly, constantly mixing the two together to say that you should be looking at this from a manual therapy point of view and also an exercise point of view. And if your weakness is manual therapy, fine. There's lots of courses you can learn. When I mean manual therapy, manipulation, soft tissue work, myofascial release, um, whatever you want to call it, any other techniques you can think of. But then exercise therapy covers a whole range. It's not just resistance. It's not just throwing weights around. It could be TheraBand work, um, uh, flexibility improvements. Um, I'm more of a, uh, I like to get my patients moving their body as a whole, because that's really what it's designed to do. But if they have, um, what's the word, uh, movements that are not in line with what they should be doing, then I may break that down into smaller planes of movement to improve that to then move on to multi-joint movements. I Personally, I'm a bigger fan of multi-joint movements than narrowing down individual movements, but sometimes that's warranted. And as a therapist, like any other professional all over the world, you've got to be flexible. And being flexible, not from a 
bend your heart hand around your head. I need flexible to step off from your patient and say, what is it they need? Do I need to crack them? Do I need to give them exercises? Can I get them doing compound exercises? Can I get them? Do I just need to do one or two manipulations? The more flexible you are in your techniques and your thought process, the better the outcome to the patient. Because fundamentally, pa patients vote uh, for therapists with their feet. What I mean by that is if you're a good therapist, people will stay with you. If you're a bad therapist, your people will stay with you for a short term, but you're not going to get results and they leave. OK. Um, OK. Let's talk about the click. So fundamentally, do you need the click? Answer me, guys, as I take a sip of my tea and look. It may look a bit back round to you. J for Jimmy. What is the click? Can anybody type fast enough? And the second question that comes from that. Emray, what did I say no to? Do you need the click? Is that what you're talking about, my, my, my friend? Is that what you're talking about? I, I, if you're talking about, if you're answering the question as no, do you need to click? I would agree, fundamentally. But also, also, I'm actually going to disagree. You do need to click. We'll come back to that. But why am I saying no? Look, I've just, I've written two books on clicking people, and I'm telling you, you don't need to click. What I'm not saying to you, because people sometimes misunderstand when I say that. What I'm not saying to you is, don't do the technique. What I am saying to you is if you do the technique and you don't get the click, it doesn't mean it hasn't worked. So let's just talk about what the click actually is. Now, what the click is, is a change in the pressure gradient within the joint. Now, then what that does by changing the pressure gradient in the joint, it moves synovial fluid around much faster, lubricating the joint. And by lubricating the joint, you desensitize the nociceptive pathways surrounding that synovial joint. Perfect. So on one hand, I'm saying to you, you do need the click. On the other hand, I'm saying you don't need the click. Actually, putting the patient into the position for the manipulation may actually be enough to change the pressure gradient in the joint, thus improving synovial fluid movement, decreasing nociceptive pain, and ideally, what did I say earlier? Improving their quality and quantity of movement. So if you do a manipulation, for example, and you actually complete it, so you know you do the short, sharp movement, but you don't hear the click, what do you do? What you, I tell you what you don't do, you don't smash up the patient, another 15 goes until you get the click. I've seen that before. How many of you have seen that? I've seen that loads of times. I've seen that from lecturers that taught me when many, many moons ago. And I used to sit there as a student going, oh, it was like it was almost like one of those car crashes that, you know, you kind of, you know, on the I don't know. To be honest, I've been home for a while due to lockdown. So I've been watching a lot of those um, kind of, you know, America's funniest videos. And you see people doing weird stuff and you kind of go, oh, I don't want to look. But secretly you look. That's what you shouldn't be doing. And we'll get to how many attempts you can of manipulation on the same area. But what I would suggest if you do the manipulation and you're not sure if you've had the effect, so you don't hear the click, you don't feel the click or essentially or the joint manipulation within your hands, retest the patient. Have they improved in quality and quantity of movement? Does the patient feel like something happened? Does the patient feel like that their pain levels have started to, to decrease? And if you're saying, well, actually, you're moving better. All right. Your pain hasn't dropped too much, but you're moving better. We said movement is medicine. Get them doing some exercises. That way, they, that way they will start to improve and you don't keep smashing the person up. That's what you shouldn't be doing. So on that, how many attempts can you do to the to the particular area? To the particular area. How many can you do? How many manipulations, guys, would you attempt to the same area? Can anyone give me a number? 
Anyone? Have a go. There's infinite numbers in the world. You just need to say one of them. And I'll give you a clue. It's not a thousand. It's a little bit south of, of a thousand. Actually, we say two. So what we mean by two is on the same area. Let's say you are uh, you're aiming for C71. You choose the manipulation that you want to do. Now, bear in mind for um, uh, Jan, one, very close, but that's your choice. And there's no right or wrong. Anything over two is wrong. <laughs> um, but if you've attempted the first one, ah, Jan, my man, two, awesome. Or it could be Jan. Um, apologies. If you're starting to go over two, then you need to stop. Why? Because basically, what structures take up or absorb the force of your manipulation? The soft tissues. And the more you do it, the more micro trauma you're creating. OK. And patients limping out of your treatment room, walking past your next patient who's waiting, limping. That is not, a, you know, would you would you go into a electronic repair shop as somebody's walking out laptop pieces going? Yeah, brilliant. That looks like a great place to go. No, your patients, they should be coming out, ideally walking on air. And the reason that they're doing that is because you haven't basically brutalized the area that you're working on. But again, that thought process, I take into every single technique that I do, whether it's dry needling, manipulation, mobilizations, um, uh, soft tissue work, uh, exercise therapy, anything. I don't want my patients uh, limping out. All right. And we keep going back to the movement is medicine. Uh, what should we go to next? What should we go to next? So we've we, I, I kind of want to go back to uh, specificity. We briefly touched on it, briefly, briefly. But now I want to actually talk about it. How specific, guys, do you think you can be? So what I mean by that is C71, off the top of my head, I, if I had to, I could probably show you about 17 to 18 different ways to use manipulation at C71. But we're not talking about that. We're talking specificity. So when people say, I would like to manipulate C71, how accurate do you think they can be? Anyone? Anyone? I'm just going to take a sip of my tea. So in terms of specificity, guys, how specific? Uh, Ben's, what, what do you mean by uh, loading? Give me some more information. But in terms of specificity, uh, the question, uh, what's the question again? The question was, how specific can you be with manipulation? So if I asked you to manipulate C71, will you, can you do your techniques to only affect only affect C71. Ah, oh, the chat room's loading. Ah. Okay. The answer is uh, kind of two angled. The answer. If you're asking me, do I do I want to be specific? The answer is absolutely. And look, we've got a couple of this. We've got a disagreement now. Some people saying no, some people saying yes. And this is the problem. So let's just kind of cut this away and say, would you like to be specific? The answer is absolutely. Absolutely. In reality, how specific am I? The answer is not that sp as specific as I'd like to be. So what I mean by that is. I, I, uh, I'll ask the question a different way. Is the body connected? The answer is yes, fundamentally, you know, from here to my foot connected to a degree. So if I use manipulation, segmental specific, then my aim is to be as specific as possible. But remember, if we're, we're using C71 as an example, 
or we could use L5S1. Let's use L5S1. L5S1, well, above L5, you've got L4. So if I affect L5S1, then I'm affecting L5, L4. And if I'm affecting L4, then I'm affecting L3. If I'm affecting L3, where does that stop? Where does that stop? And actually, there has been research done on specificity. And you'd be surprised at how inaccurate we are as therapists. And I take that knowledge into my treatments. So, for example, yes, I may set the patient up for a C71 or L5S1 or T2, T3. But in reality, I'm thinking, right, above and below, left, right, front, back, how how am I affecting that area? So, for example, if somebody has an L5S1 fusion, how close will I get? At the closest I'll get, depending on how we do it, um, I would only go to T2 over L1. I wouldn't go further down because they have a metal attachment. Can you damage it? Theoretically, yes. So why would you try? And it's this lack of specificity that we have to admit that we have when we're doing manipulation. But the intention is to be segmental specific. I'm hoping that is clear. We're not magicians. OK, the body's connected and you on one hand cannot say the body's connected and then disconnect it on when when you choose to. It doesn't work this way. You know, if you're giving somebody. Uh, a shoulder exercise um, and basically say, I want to activate your your posterior deltoid. Well, how do you deactivate then the uh, serratus posterior superior? How do you deactivate uh, rhomboid major, rhomboid minor? How do you deactivate levator scapula? The answer is you can't. So you cannot have your cake and eat it. You need to appreciate that the body's connected and use appropriate techniques and appropriate force. And that is what we discuss on the courses. Specificity, uh, force. We discuss this and less is more. Uh, the question somebody's asked, correction for spinal scoliosis, which direction should we give? Um, very easy question. Uh, very sorry, very easy answer. You cannot correct scoliosis with manipulation. So I'm sorry if I've just dashed your... Uh, your thought process there, uh, sir, uh, but you can't do that. Um, the best evidence for scoliosis of any form is actually fundamentally exercise. Uh, I'm not saying you cannot use manipulation above or below left, right uh, of the scoliotic curve, but you cannot correct scoliosis with manipulation. That even exercise doesn't correct it. What you're doing is with the exercise and the manual therapy is improving the quality and quantity of movement, improving the um, uh, uh, fatigability of the muscle, surrounding muscles around it and just giving them as best quality and quantity of movement as you possibly can. But you're not going to correct the scoliosis. That, unfortunately, if you're ultimately wanting to correct a profound curvature sort of 35 well 20 25 30 45 degrees that is a surgical procedure in my humble opinion uh, so hopefully i've answered that one um how do we get to uh i don't know what you mean by improving and maintaining that it won't advance and exacerbate can you just uh, try and elaborate on that question for me and i'll come back to it um Palpation. How well can you palpate? And this kind of leads us back to specificity. It leads us back to your testing, because in order to get to a manipulation, you have to have done a thorough screening test. Now, evidence is, is coming is coming fast that actually our clinical examinations are not as accurate as they as they maybe should be or we want them to be. Does that mean we don't do them? No, it just means we take it as a fundamental bit of information as a whole. Like, for example, if you were a surgeon, you would not just use an MRI to make a diagnosis. You'd use your case history, the question behind the patient, your palpation. You would use individual pieces as a jigsaw puzzle. 
what we have done unfortunately as manual therapists we have got into this notion of using our clinical examinations as a as a um uh as a gold standard if it says this this is what we think it is no we use the case history we use the testing we use any further information that we have uh, such as mris x-rays no one individual piece uh formulates the final diagnosis uh, or working diagnosis each individual piece has to be taken into account what you don't do is go prod 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 on the patient ow oh that's what we should use and, and crack them that's not the way it works because actually fundamentally uh, the research behind palpation is flawed um, and it's of poor quality and the outcomes are not necessarily in our favor um you know you might have practitioners that say they can feel um and here's a here's a, a bit of an anatomy quiz uh you know three stars whoever get it gets it right how many and don't use google how many degrees of rotation uh of the lumbar spine is there i'll give you 10 seconds to answer it who can type the fastest how many degrees of rotation are there in the lumbar spine come on guys chop chop you must it's you're not using many numbers how many degrees of rotation five in total rotation my man rotation five five degrees not 45 five of rotation five degrees okay basically approximately one degree of rotation per segment now do you honestly believe that you can palpate the difference of one degree from one segment to the next maybe you can i'm not sure that most people can um and who's to say that let's say you decide l4 is incorrect or is you know if you've decided due to your skillful palpation that you've decided L4 is dysfunctional, my argument to you would be, what have you decided that against? How have you, how do you know that L4 is not the one that's in the correct anatomical position and L5 and L3 above and below it are incorrect? This is why palpation, again, is not the, um, should not be held as this uh, gold, golden, entity of your therapy okay it should not be held it's a part of the jigsaw puzzle it's a very relevant process but it's not the be on end all it should be taken into account with your uh testing procedures your questioning your case history any medical based diagnosis such as mri x-rays because you are medical grade practitioners um we're not um magic beings we can, and a lot of time with palpation, you end up telling yourself that it's there, not necessarily what's actually happening because it always happens. And this is the thing that I realized as a patient and as a practitioner, whenever you do a technique, uh, Marine, well done, one degree at each level, well done, three stars. Um, whenever I went for a treatment as a patient, I always got examined, patient, the practitioner would always um, palpate the area, uh, always press on the area of pain and go and I'd say yes ouch that's that's great then they do the techniques and then they retest which is what they should do but never ever did a practitioner ever say at the end oh god yes I've made that worse always you've made it better always but that, that to me is impossible there you're not magic it's impossible you cannot make everyone better and that's what got me thinking even as a patient i said this cannot be true every time you do something it's a positive effect that can't happen and this is why motion palpation is is flawed i didn't say irrelevant it's flawed and you've got to understand what you're taking from it and actually uh giles and i we are in the process of uh doing further research into motion and palpation so keep your eyes peeled and uh we'll be um trying to get that out as quickly as possible um okay uh we've touched on a few of the next one 
mistakes therapists make um they don't test massive mistake uh and 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 and, and an unethical mistake um they use too many manipulations so how many should you be using i go on the basis of all my manual therapy all my uh therapy in general less is more uh, i try not to use more than two different techniques uh around affecting the same area um i don't crack people's neck at every appointment uh you know somebody comes in for a foot problem and they get their neck cracked that's not therapy that's just doing whatever the hell you want to do that's not what it's about it your technique should be relevant to what you're doing but two maybe three at the appointment should be more than enough um because you run the risk of uh over we can use the term overstimulating uh traumatizing the area creating too much um soft tissue trauma because your patients should not be spending three days recovering from the treatment that you have done to then spend another three days recovering from the problem that they came in with for you to try and fix otherwise they may as well take some ibuprofen sit at home and save themselves however many dirhams or pounds or dollars or um euros that it may be okay and remember the money that they're paying you can't compare one country to the next fundamentally you know it's a lot of money that people spend with us and it's a fantastic job i love my job and it's it's it gives people a great life but i treat my patients fairly and if they do not need the treatment i don't bring them in so on that how many another mistake patient practitioners make therapists make is they over treat so how many treatments should somebody need again we have a we have a rule um it's a clinic rule it's a it's a, a, a human being to human being rule we we assume uh, and this giles and i and uh, any practitioners we that we have in our clinics um if the patient fundamentally has not improved with from their print presenting symptoms by around 70 75 percent within four treatments four not 40 and not four in the same week okay four treatments then I would suggest that you are looking in the wrong area, you have the wrong diagnosis, or fundamentally, you just don't understand what's going on, okay? Now, again, there are caveats to that. Somebody may come in with a underlying presenting conditions, like a very common one, uh, or fairly common, unfortunately, is rheumatoid arthritis. You may not improve their symptoms within four treatments, but you've already discussed that with them somebody who's diabetic the fundamentals of the blood flow issue of diabetes may slow down their uh their uh, improvement speed but again you've discussed that i'm talking about patients who come in with no diagnosed underlying conditions nothing that you think is there um they should be improved by around four sessions back into an exercise uh rehabilitation program uh, which doesn't have to be extensive or back in the gym if they're a gym goer uh, very very quickly after four treatments they've got a few options with me uh, they either go back to their general doctor they may need further discussions we may refer them directly uh, for imaging such as x-ray ultrasounds mris and i appreciate different countries work in different ways so you know your direct access will be slightly different but you know i'm giving my point of view on what we do and you've got to mold it around what works for you um or uh we fundamentally refer them back uh, to their gp to, uh, their what we call the general practitioners in the uk uh, their general doctor family doctor um who can then refer them to appropriate specialists maybe a rheumatologist uh maybe an orthopedic surgeon um brain surgeons yeah whoever it may be if it's not if you're not the appropriate person they need to be going in the right direction full stop okay and the reason that i say it like this is because i get patients now that i haven't may not see for five years and actually maybe uh before all of the the covid problems uh i had actually had a patient who i hadn't spoken to uh i don't know in about six years ring me up and say oh jimmy i've got this problem 
Um, and luckily, because we've got all everything electronic, went through his notes and said, but you have this underlying condition. Oh, yes, I forgot about that. Well, don't shouldn't you go back to your doctor to check that over? He checked it over two weeks later. He rang me back saying, thank you very much. Um, my doctor's given me the appropriate medication to solve that. Uh, my symptoms got better. Um, thank you very much. Job done. And that is what we call overarching healthcare. OK, it's not just about somebody coming in and you fundamentally just cracking them. There is a bigger picture to uh, your therapy and manipulation. Uh, any other therapist mistakes? I think I've kind of covered the ones that really, really stand out um, from there. Uh, how much manipulate? A question people ask me: How much manipulation do I do in a treatment? Um, as I've already said, less is more in terms of uh, in the treatment. Uh, probably no more than two, maybe three. Uh, as a whole percentage across my patient spectrum, I probably use manipulation uh, about 75% of the time. It's extremely effective, but again, clearly not effective for everyone. So just remember that. Um, a question uh, people keep asking is, can you use manipulation on children? Yes. No. Maybe. Um, uh Ben's therapist trying to do all the techniques in a in a patient. Uh yes, we've I think we've fairly discussed that. How many frequent can manipulation sessions be in a week? We'll come back to that. Hold fire. Um, can you manipulate children? In short, the answer is yes, no, maybe. Should you? Uh, well, look, if we're going from a research base, there's not for me, there's not enough research on uh, manipulation with children. So when I mean children, I mean uh, again, depends on what country you're in, the classification of a child. Uh, I would be extremely reluctant to use manipulation on anyone under the age of uh, 16. Uh, the reason being, we don't really know fundamentally yet via research the effect of manipulation on growth plates. Um, we would assume that it's fine, but there's not enough. So I would suggest manipulation being done on children at the absolute last resort. And what I mean by that is you've gone through a thorough case history. You've tried your manual therapy techniques. You may have even referred them for imaging scans and everything comes back negative. I would then think about using manipulation. I would use mobilizations, uh, stretch based therapies, uh, exercise therapy, my fascia release, everything before I use manipulation. And the reason I say that is because that's how I'd expect someone to treat my children. Um, and that's how actually I treat my own children if I need to. Um, manipulation is the last resort. But I'm not saying it's not applicable. It is applicable. You can use it. But it's the last one. Um, what are the absolute contraindications for manipulation? Uh, fundamentally no different to all your other manual therapies. And we cover those more in depth. Um, there are generic contraindications for all manual therapy any technique but we cover those more in depth on the course uh which i would probably say you uh, should be coming in september um and i would stress that you get the book as well because we cover those more in depth and it'd be impossible for me to give you a list and it's not relevant just to give you a blanket list um a lot of it is common sense you know like if your leg's falling off you're not manipulation's not going to to help um but on a more serious note um, an easy one uh, if somebody has rheumatoid arthritis and uh, they, you assume it's a flare up of their condition, don't use manipulation. Full stop. All right. But we cover those more in depth. Are there any treatment protocols? No. Apart from test, treat, retest. Uh, many dentists, TMJ pain, you know, does manipulation. Actually, we're in the process, uh, Rakesh, my man, uh, we're in the process of writing a TMJ uh, seminar. And that is very close to being finished. Uh, so the answer is yes, there's loads you can do, uh, external in and internal also, in line with working with the dentist. So yes, so keep your eyes peeled. Um, and you never know, we might even bring it to uh, uh, Dubai with Learnovate. Um, well, will kids really cooperate with manipulation? Yes, you'd be surprised. Uh, it's a bit like one of those, when you're in pain or you have discomfort, it's surprising how um cooperative you become and actually uh it's working in pediatrics uh if you're a pediatric physio you will understand what i mean by this you get 
a different skill set to be working with children um and there's different ways uh, that you have to approach it and it is a whole different re uh, course remit in its own in its own right hence why when it comes to the courses we mainly talk about uh patients from 16 and above okay um i think that's it from me for now uh, i'm happy to answer any questions where was that question that I said I would come back to? Uh, how frequent can manipulation sessions be in a week? I think we've answered that. Um, I tend to treat patients more, no more than once a week. Uh, if they're extremely acute, um, you are, um, I would say maybe uh, twice in a week at absolute maximum. I don't believe in the treatments where they say you've got to come in three times a week for the next six weeks. Uh, you know, and you're spending about a million dollars on your treatment. I wish that was the case, uh, to be honest. I'd be sitting in a much bigger house than I am currently, if that was the case. Um, but look, once a week tends to be more than enough and your treatments should be trying to be different each time. So just rubbing, shaking and cracking is not, that's not therapy, that's painting by numbers. Um, uh, Vimala, you're welcome. You're very much very welcome, Rakesh. You're welcome. Has there been any time that after using all your main therapy? Was it? Yes. Yes. I'm not magic. I'm extremely good looking. That is the truth. But but I'm not magic. I don't fix everyone. I've there are times where I've made people worse. Um, and that's actually a good question. Have I actually ever hurt someone seriously with manipulation? No. The 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 hurt to, the hurt main hurt is to my ego when people don't get better because obviously i think i'm the best therapist in the world and the reality is um i'd like to think that it, i maybe i am but the reality is i'm probably not um so that's the downside and that's the problem the hit on my ego uh but yes mainly the the worst thing is is that they haven't got better but that's why we have the the kind of uh ethical rule of if they're not better within four treatments you need to start need, needing to look elsewhere uh, or you're in the wrong part of the body you know think think outside the box um pratik has there been any time that I've, oh I've, sorry i've said that one finally what is which technique is my favorite ah it's not per se a technique there's two answers to this um my favorite technique is when somebody comes in you know and it tends to happen with the neck or the lumbers. You know, they come in like this, uh, like that. Or they, you know, they're bent over and they can't move. And you literally barely touch someone. You click them and then they suddenly stand up straight or they get movement and they're like, whoa, like your David, David Copperfield. You've just done this amazing magic trick. That's my favorite. Why? Because it's just a nice tap on the back. It's a rub on my ego. I love it. And if you say you don't love it, I think you're lying and you don't appreciate that you have an ego. Um, but in terms of my favorite technique actually the one i like to do i like peripheral techniques i love doing manipulation on the on the feet and the lower limb uh but look i gotta be honest uh when i was a student the one i was always mainly scared of was the neck i don't know why uh people assume the neck is more dangerous than anything else it's i believe me it's not um it's just the one that seems to get more attention um but i like neck techniques and i'm happy to do them when it's appropriate but I'm the first person to say I don't want to do it because I don't think it's appropriate. Hopefully I've answered that question. Uh, manual therapy, spinal manipulation, which one affect faster in our body? Um, both are working on the pain gate theory. Pain gate theory comes from many years ago, approximately 1960, 1962 uh, from Melzac. Um, pain gate theory, and I don't mean this crudely, but it's an oversimplified, oversimplified version uh of neurophysiological effects so that is what we call cover more in depth in the book so have a look at that um but any any technique will have a very similar effect but manipulation can sometimes speed up the process uh of improving quality and quantity of movement but that depends on and we discussed this um and in, within the courses um which one would you do and we try and give you a kind of uh an idea of what we would do but fundamentally you're the expert in the room it's your decision whether you use manipulation or mobilizations or mobilizations and soft tissue therapy that's fundamentally uh your choice Pratik, oh thank you very much it's always nice to get some some nice feedback but you're rubbing my ego again stop it <laughs> love it it's always nice it's always nice especially on a bright sunny day um 
yeah i think i think to be honest i think i've gone through everything i want to do um dr fake are there any other questions that have come up i can see some on the thread i've tried to answer them as much as possible uh do you have any that have come else that have come? Uh, how accurate how accurate is it to manipulate a person with a high level of disc herniation um right well i would say you need to be extremely careful there if uh i would say if they have neurological signs or neurological pathology um you need to be thinking at that stage is manipulation even warranted um or have they had a prior herniation where they've had maybe a, a, a discectomy a, a laminectomy should you even be doing manipulation so i think that's the best um uh answer to that question um i have a patient with cochadenia can be manipulated um how did they get it come back to me on that uh what to say the top three or most areas where manipulation required uh you shouldn't be viewing it like that um you use manipulation um because most joints can benefit from manipulation um but most people if you're asking me what they come in for most patients um appear with neck thoracic or lumbar pain i think that's probably the ones that tend to get used manipulation on the most um but does just by cracking them doesn't those areas doesn't mean you solve the the problem so you got to look further uh if a person having an incision in front of his neck thyroidectomy seven years uh, i would say uh you need to understand why they had a thyroidectomy uh but i would say that's an extremely big caution extremely big because many reasons it may there could be a parathyroid problem uh they could have had a uh benign tumor they could have had cancer uh malignant uh, malignant cancer you need to think more from that but i'd say extreme caution uh geriatric patients uh very easy no unless you like your patients to sound like chandeliers uh is it normal to have pain after manipulation uh it is fairly normal to have a moderate level of discomfort not pain they're two different things and that's normal and i say that it doesn't matter whether you massage them manipulate them give them exercises it should not be higher than the pain that they came in with hopefully that answers that uh, she uh, is this the cochadinia uh, she had stiffness in her si joint as well she doesn't have history of fall um right if she's had four c-sections you need to be thinking uh adhesions uh you need to be thinking bigger and possibly uh, a further examination to see if there are any adhesions within the abdominal cavity because the pain that she may be having in the coccyx area may not be coming from the coccyx so i would suggest you look at the bigger picture if it is coming from the area you need to look at the lumbar spine the pubic symphysis as well as the um as well as the um uh surrounding areas and the soft tissues thing to everyone uh, I, I really appreciate your time uh, that you've spent listening to me it's always uh, extremely humbling to me uh, for me that people listen to anything i say uh, I, I i do tell my wife and my children to do the same but they don't listen um the main thing i want to uh, <clears throat> say to you guys is in the time that is going on globally i, I need you guys to stay safe uh, stay well um if you need to stay home stay home uh spend the time enjoying yourselves and your families and and things like that but mainly take this time like i've done uh, to actually go back and read and i've been looking at a lot of anatomy books and remembering things that i had to remember many years ago that i've forgotten right when nobody is a, a um a magician nobody can remember everything so stay home stay safe and uh, do some reading oh and don't forget follow us on instagram uh, ot training 8989 uh, i expect you to get in touch i expect you to be sending me some messages and i to be honest i want to see some videos of um you guys exercising and uh, and uh, practicing your techniques but if you've got anything let us know but hopefully i'll be seeing you guys in september awesome